Hello, my name is Christy Hanlon and I'll be your instructor this semester. Welcome to Statistics and welcome to my home office, my own little math and art space. I'll be doing little intro videos like this for future videos to give you an idea of what to expect out of that section and to remind you what to watch for. This is the lecture video for Chapter 1, Section 1. This is also the first video where I'm expecting you to follow along with the lecture notes, filling in blanks and working out problems. If you haven't already done so, you need to locate the lecture notes on the Pearson course website, as I will not be printing these out for you in the future. Look at the menus on the left side of the website, click on Video and Resource Library, then Document Sharing, and then the Chapter Prep folder for the appropriate chapter. That's how you'll find the notes to print off for future sections. As I described in class, you will need to actually print these out because I will check that you have them completed the next class period. Also, as I explained, I expect you to do these as assigned before we do practice work for that material in class. I know it may seem a little backward compared to other classes, but believe me when I say you'll absorb a lot more of the material this way. The lecture notes for this section also include notes for the following section, 1.2, as they've been assigned together, but there will be a separate video for 1.2. The idea behind the lecture notes is for the process of going through a section to be more engaging. In order to complete the notes, you have to pay enough attention to the video to watch for items to fill in. This is not to give you more work, but the hope is it will be more thought-provoking than just listening to me tell it to you, or having you read it all on your own. And hopefully this will give you a slightly deeper experience with the material, so you're more likely to retain it. Okay, a few tips here at the beginning. Watch for notation. There are a ton of formulas and statistics, and every one of them has fun little symbols and letters that you need to know the meaning of to use them correctly. I advise finding a spot in your notebook, maybe a section in the back, that you reserve especially for notes on notation. You'll want to record the symbol, how to say it, and what it means. You may even want to note different formulas that it belongs to. We won't be introducing much notation in this first section, but be thinking about that for the future. Here at the beginning, you're mostly going to be focusing on terminology, which leads me to my next point, academic language. You'll want to get in the habit of referring to things correctly in statistics because everything here has a context. And if you're not using the right terminology, you may be talking about the wrong thing. So when you're filling in words and definitions on the lecture notes, pay attention to those terms that are being defined. Next, become friends with your calculator. If you haven't already, you need to invest in a TI-83 or 84 calculator right away. It's required for this course, and we're going to be using it a lot. We won't be using it for this section, but we will be starting it very soon. Also, don't dread it. Just realize it's part of the language that you're learning as part of this class. Okay, the rest of this video is instruction, so get ready. All right, let's get started. You are probably already familiar with many of the practices in statistics, such as taking surveys, collecting data, and describing populations. What you may not know is that collecting accurate statistical data is often difficult and costly. Consider, for instance, the monumental task of counting and describing the entire population of the United States. If you were to oversee such a census, how would you do it? How would you ensure that your results are accurate? These and many more concerns are the responsibility of the United States Census Bureau, which conducts the census every decade. In Chapter 1, you will be introduced to the basic concepts and goals of statistics. Namely, in this first section, our objectives will be to formally define statistics as both a field of study and a characteristic coming from a sample, to learn how to distinguish between a population and a sample, and between a parameter and a statistic. We'll also learn how to distinguish between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Let's get started. The most important and perhaps most obvious question to ask here at the beginning is what exactly is statistics? Statistics is a science of collecting, organizing, analyzing, and interpreting data to make decisions. You can think of this definition almost like a large wheel, with each of these action words as a spoke or rung of that wheel. They each play a key role in the process to keep it moving. Let's look closer at each one as it relates to statistics. Collect. 
Collecting refers to the physical gathering of information, like distributing surveys, collecting samples, or observing experiments. Once the collection is done, we begin to organize all of this raw information. Organizing is really the grunt work part of the wheel, sorting everything out into their respective groups and tallying up the number of responses within each class. By the third spoke of the wheel, the analysis part, the goal becomes less organizational and more analytical. At this phase, we need a way to not only make the information easier to understand and discuss, but we also need methods to describe things like patterns and trends that might not be immediately visible when the information is all clustered together as raw data. We do things like find averages, make calculations to help describe any variation. We construct visual representations such as graphs and tables, which is often a huge aid in making the conceptual ideologies more tangible. Now right after the analyze phase, there is a clear divide in terms of the overall process. We move from a state of physical work of collecting, organizing, and analyzing to the critical thinking step of interpreting. Based on the analysis that has been done, can we explain the results meaningfully? Are they statistically significant? How likely are we to repeat the process and receive the same outcomes? Then the last step is to make conclusions and possibly decisions based on our study. We look both at our results and at our process to evaluate for problems. Were there any factors that may have introduced bias or confounding elements that may have confused results? Do we need to make adjustments and repeat the study? Do the results of our study call for a change of some kind? Maybe that change is environmental or political or medical. Okay, so we've talked about the process, but we haven't defined a word that is critical in the field of statistics, and that is data. What is data? Data is information coming from observations, counts, measurements, or responses. It can be numbers, information in graphs or tables, or opinions. Here are a few examples so you can see how varied data can be. According to a survey, more than 7 in 10 Americans say a nursing career is a prestigious occupation. And social media consumes kids today as well, as more score their first social media accounts at an average age of 11.4 years old. Both of these represent data. Don't think that data only means numbers. People's opinions can be data. Both examples demonstrate how data in a statistical study is just information that has been collected. Data is categorized in three ways, by set, classification, and level of measurement. We're going to be covering sets of data in this section, and we'll get to the other ways of characterizing data a little later. So what are data sets? Well, there are two types of data sets. One is population. Population is the collection of all outcomes, responses, measurements, or counts that are of interest. Now don't get bogged down with the word population. This does not necessarily refer to people who occupy a country or a city. Population can be anything that is being studied. It could be all adult dogs in the United States. It could be all female law students at Harvard. The key idea of a population is that it is the entire collection of whatever it is that you're studying. Let's say I'm doing a study of all male nursing students at WBUP. That means that I am collecting data on every male nursing student at the university. Not every student, not every nursing student, just the male nursing students, but all of them in their entirety is my population. A subset or part of the population is the sample set. This is a small piece or section of the population that has been pulled to represent the population and is being studied. In the previous example of male nursing students, a sample could be all of the male nursing students in their second year. This would be a subset of the population or a sample set. Now we will talk about selection of samples later because it is very important that a sample be chosen using an appropriate method so it is representative of the entire population. For now, just know that the sample needs to be representative of the population and it is a subset of the population. Let's do an example to make sure we understand the difference between the data set that is population and the data set that is the sample. 
In a recent survey, 834 employees in the United States were asked if they thought their jobs were highly stressful. Of the 834 respondents, 517 said yes. Identify the population in the sample and describe the sample data set. The population consists of the responses of all employees in the U.S. The sample consists of the responses of the 834 employees in the survey. The sample is a subset of the responses of all employees in the U.S. The sample data set consists of 517 people who said yes and 317 people who said no. Note that the Venn diagram here does not reflect the size of the subset. It is only used to illustrate that the responses of the employees in the survey is a subset of the population. Now that we can tell a population set from a sample set, let's talk about the information in each. A parameter is a numerical description of a population characteristic. An example would be the average age of all people in the United States. A statistic is a numerical description of a sample characteristic. An example might be the average age of people from a sample of three states. It helps that parameter and population both start with P and statistics and sample both start with S. That could help you remember that they are related. It's important to note that Statistics can change from sample to sample, but population parameters will remain the same. No matter how many times I add up the ages of everyone in the country and divide by the number of people in the country, I'm going to come up with the same parameter. But it's reasonable to assume that I'm going to come up with different values if I go state to state. Sample statistics are not constant, but population parameters are fixed values. Let's do some practice problems. A survey of several hundred collegiate student athletes in the United States found that during the season of their sport, the average time spent on athletics by student athletes is 50 hours per week. Pause the video and decide if the number given is a population parameter or a sample statistic. Okay. There are obviously more than several hundred college student athletes in the country, so this set of responses is only part of the population, a subset or sample. So because the average 50 hours per week is based on a subset of the population, it is a sample statistic. Okay, let's do another one. The freshman class at a university has an average SAT math score of 514. Pause the video and decide if the number given is a population parameter or a sample statistic. The population given in this example is the entire freshman class, and since the number given includes results for every person in that population, this is a population parameter. Okay, let's do one more. In a random check of several hundred retail stores, the Food and Drug Administration found that 34% of the stores were not storing fish at the proper temperature. Pause the video and decide if the number given is a population parameter or a sample statistic. Just like in the first example, there are clearly more than several hundred retail stores in the country. That means the study is using a subset or sample, so the number 34% is a sample statistic. We talked earlier about the process of statistics being cyclical and how it can be like a wheel with the different spokes representing different parts of the process. Well, there are two parts of statistics that align with the various steps in the process. Statistics can be broken down into two branches, descriptive, and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics aligns with the beginning processes of the wheel, the organization, summarization, and display of the data. Inferential statistics aligns with the stages using sample data to draw conclusions about the population. Let's go over a few examples where we identify the population in the sample, then we determine which part of the study represents the descriptive branch of statistics and what conclusions can be drawn from the study using inferential statistics. Study number one. 
A study of 2,560 U.S. adults found that of adults not using the internet, 23% are from households earning less than 30000 annually, as shown in the figure. Pause the video and identify the different pieces of the puzzle. The population, the sample, the information representing the descriptive branch of statistics, and what conclusions we might draw. Got it figured out? All right, here's the solution. The population consists of the responses of all U.S. adults. The sample consists of the responses of the 2,560 U.S. adults in the study. The descriptive branch of statistics involves the statement 23% from households earning less than 30,000 annually do not use the internet. A possible inference drawn from the study is that lower income households cannot afford access to the internet. Okay, let's do another. Study number two. A study of 300 Wall Street analysts found that the percentage who incorrectly forecasted high-tech earnings in a recent year was 44%. Pause the video and identify the different pieces of the puzzle. The population, the sample, the information representing the descriptive branch of statistics, and what conclusions we might draw. And here's the solution. Population consists of the responses of all Wall Street analysts. And the sample consists of the responses of the 300 Wall Street analyst participants in the study. The part of the study that represents the descriptive branch of statistics involves the statement, the percentage who incorrectly forecasted high-tech earnings in a recent year was 44%. A possible inference drawn from the study is that the stock market is difficult to forecast, even for professionals. Okay, now that we've talked about how statistics is a cyclical process, and the different steps represent spokes of the wheel as it progresses, here is a visual to help you understand this further. It lays out the stages in a statistical study. To start with, the team needs to identify the goals of the study. What are they trying to accomplish or discover? During this process, they will identify who belongs in the population of the study. Are they concerned with all U.S. adults or all dogs in large U.S. city pounds? The next step is to draw from the population an appropriate sample to study. We will talk more about the methods scientists use to create samples. From the samples, they collect the raw data from the study itself. This is when sample statistics come into play. You'll notice that to the right is an arrow showing that this whole side of the wheel is within the scope of the descriptive branch of statistics. Everything from selecting samples to collecting and organizing data is part of this side of the process. Then we switch to the inferential branch of statistics. This is when we make conclusions that relate the sample statistics results to the population parameters in order to make conclusions. We also at this point evaluate our study for flaws, bias, or confounding details and determine whether we need to run a different study or if this one achieved our goals. Okay, that's it for this section. You made it through your first one. Congratulations. I'll see you on the next video.